Well, hello. Hello. I wasn't expecting you yet. You're here too soon. But that's okay. <laughs> I was doing something else over here on the side and got distracted. Good morning. <clears throat> Glad you're here with us on this Friday morning. It's Friday with Pastor Sutton for our daily devotion, a little time in God's Word on this Friday, February 10th. I'm glad you're you're here with us for it. Uh, a little cooler today uh, here in the in the North Woods, the, the the lower North Woods, the Southern North Woods. That's I, I don't know how you express it. It's because I'm north of County J, which puts me in the North Woods. But then some people say the North Woods doesn't begin until you're north of Tomahawk, which is 11 miles north of here. And then other people say it doesn't begin until you're north of Highway 8, um, which certainly there is a transition point there of many things. No, I'm going to stick with the North Woods. It, it, it really is, because <clears throat> the first town south of me is Merrill, Wisconsin, which is just kind of a regular Midwestern town. Um, but then you pass by the big burg of Irma here and you go north to Tomahawk and you begin to enter into some of the tourist type things, uh, restaurants and, and shops that are more oriented on tourism, but not intensely. It's kind of like a, a, a small mix, right? And then you get north of, once you're north of, of um, Tomahawk, then things start to change and definitely uh, more antique stores, more gift shops, more um, irregular kinds of things, um, in addition to all the regular things, but definitely moves more towards the tourist. I don't care. I'm in the Northwoods. I don't care what you say. It's a woods outside my back window, and I'm in what I would say without a doubt is the north part of Wisconsin. And it's 14 degrees according to the weather service today. I didn't check my thermometers, and, and Bonnie is off on errands, so she's not uh, giving us a temperature read necessarily. But I'm glad you're here. Let's see who you are this morning. Leela, good morning to you. Kathy, good morning. Verna, good morning. And there's Jerry, 39 degrees. <laughs> I kind of miss that moderated weather of the thumb. Not the humidity so much, though. And then there's Kelly. Good morning to you. And Connie and Robin chiming in. It is Friday already. Yeah. Um, yeah. So good morning to you two up there. Cloudy and overcast in, in Harshaw. It is. It, well, I don't know. I see some spots of blue uh, between the clouds up there. So maybe maybe it's clearing. I, I don't know. Um, yep, there's Bonnie. She's on the road. Had to pick up groceries after dropping those in. And she's saying it's 11 degrees. Now she's going off of the thermometer on the truck, I'm sure. Ann and Deb and Grant, good morning to you guys. Let me refresh here and see if anybody else has popped in while I've been doing all of this nonsense. Yeah, uh, Bonnie says the snow says Northwoods for us. And good morning, Renee. Uh, so there's... There's all you all. Good morning to those who are or midday or what have you, to those who are joining a little bit later in the day or watching on YouTube. I'm glad you're taking a little time here in uh, God's Word. So, with that in mind, let's get down into this. If you have the Lutheran Service Book, page 295, Daily Prayer for Individuals and Families, I've got my treasury of daily prayer right here as we... As we uh, make our beginning as we do each day here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm today is, um, oh, I, actually, before we go to the psalm, we have a commemoration today. Today is, is the commemoration of Silas, 
uh, who is a fellow worker of both St. Peter and St. Paul. Silas, a leader in the church at Jerusalem, was chosen by Paul, that's in Acts chapter 15, to accompany him on his second missionary journey from Antioch to Asia Minor in Macedonia. Silas, also known as Silvanus, Silvanus, was imprisoned with Paul at Philippi and experienced the riots in Thessalonica and Berea. After rejoining Paul in Corinth, Silas apparently remained there for an extended period of time. Sometime later, he apparently joined the Apostle Peter, likely serving as Peter's secretary. That's 1 Peter chapter 5. Tradition says that Silas, Silvanus, was the first bishop of the church in, in Corinth. So uh, this morning we, we remember and commemorate Silas, fellow worker of uh, Saints Peter and Paul. Hey, Geraldine and Neil, good morning. Good morning. I uh, just refreshed and I see your names popped up. So, all right, back to the psalm. Again, our psalm today kind of divided up in, in unique ways. It's Psalm 38, uh, but we're going to have 1 through 3 and then verse 6 and then verse 9 through 11 and then verses 21 and 22. So if you're following along in your Bible, it doesn't follow along. So Psalm 38 in portions. <clears throat> oh, Lord, rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. There you got it. I'm off to a good start on a Friday morning. Oh, Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me. In the light of my eyes, it is also gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The light of my eyes has also gone from me. That's an interesting phrase. Um, in In more ancient times, the, the the followers of Christ were called the enlightened ones. Now, this is written before that. This is a psalm. It's written um, probably in the time of David, since it's under you know, since it's Psalm thirty eight. Um, but the, the the Christians of the early church were often called enlightened. And in fact, we, when, when Luther explains the Apostles' Creed, the third part, I believe in the Holy Spirit, uh, he gathers, um, gathers and enlightens the whole church. Uh, that enlightening is the, is the understanding of God's grace and wisdom. Uh, it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Um, and so light is important. And, you know, even, even on a very uh, visceral sense, in, in the dark, in, in a gut feeling, um, we tend to be more trusting of somebody who has bright eyes than we do of somebody who has very dark eyes, um, uh, eyes nearing, nearing on black. Um, and even in, in, popular media today and television programs and things like that, if they want to portray somebody as a demon or possessed by a demon, um, now they'll they'll put black uh, an effect of black eyes on the person and the eyes the eyes being black means that they're uh, they're, they're evil or they're wicked. Um, so that's just a just a thought that goes with that song David is David is is um, suffering. Um, under something, and I don't know what. I'd have to go look at Psalm 38 in detail. Uh, but the point is, when it comes to the end, even in the midst of his suffering, even as the light is fading from his eyes, 
um, even as his friends and companions, much like Job, um, are standing aloof and kin far off. Um, he calls on God to not forsake him, to make haste to help him, because he knows that the Lord, uh, our God, is his salvation, as he is ours in times of, of need and, and distress. So that's our psalm this morning. Psalm 4, or Psalm 4. I pushed the button 4, and now 4 is my head. Job chapter 6, verses 14 to 30. That's our reading today. Picking up where we left off yesterday, Job was telling us uh, how his uh, how his complaint, again, I'm using the heading, which is never a good thing. Well, not never, rarely a good thing. But how his complaint against God is justified, how he is, how he is just. Um, remember yesterday he called for God to just, if, if, if this is the way it is, God, then just crush me and get it over with. Um, I would rather suffer enduring pain um, than put up with this as long as it came to my end. And what end do I have? That's kind of where Job ended the thought yesterday. How, why am I being patient? What what value is there in my in the end of this that I am being patient? And so we pick up now at verse 14 of chapter 6. He who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers are treacherous as a torrent bed. What's a torrent bed? As, a torrential, as torrential streams that pass away which are dark with ice and where the snow hides itself. When they melt, they disappear. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The caravans turn aside from their course. They go up into the waste and perish. The caravans of Tima look, the travelers of Sheba hope. They are ashamed because they were confident. They come there and are disappointed. For you have now become nothing. You see my calamity and are afraid. Have I said, make me a gift? Or from your wealth, offer a bribe for me? Or deliver me from the adversary's hand? Or redeem me from the hand of the ruthless? Teach me and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone astray. How forceful are upright words. But what does reproof from you reprove? Do you think that you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? You would even cast lots over the fatherless and bargain over your friend. But now be pleased to look at me, for I will not lie to your face. Please turn. Let no injustice be done. Turn now. My vindication is at stake. Is there any injustice on my tongue? Cannot my palate discern the cause of calamity? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm running low on coffee and my wife is not here to refill it. What suffering I must have. I'm going to refresh the screen here for just a minute. Um, so Job has issued his complaint and he's speaking to his friends. Hey, Kendra. Hey, Glenn. Good morning. He's speaking towards his friends. He's talking about his situation. So, um, you know, they're, they're speaking ill of him. And he's, he, it, it appears, it's within quotation marks. Where does it close the quotes? Um, let's see. Uh, well, that's interesting. It opens quotes at the beginning of verse 14 but I don't see where the quotes close. And then it opens quotes again at verse 24, and I don't see where those, where those close. I wonder if there's a, a printing error here. Now, of course, the, the one thing that I must say as I, as I think about this is that, of course, in the Hebrew, there's no punctuation, just as there's no very little punctuation in the Greek. Um, the punctuation is added by the English translators. Um, the uh, the punctuation would come from the grammar, right? In both in Hebrew and in Greek, the majority of of uh, hi, oh, you are home. 
Oh, thanks be to God and my coffee. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the punctuation is put in by the translators. It's, it's understood by the grammar. Um, the both Hebrew and Greek, not using trans, not using punctuation, um, but but we can understand when something is a question or when something is possessive or something like that by the by the the grammar by the by the language itself. No need to have punctuation. In fact, even English didn't used to have a lot of punctuation. It was added uh, as time went on. So I don't know what the, the the whole thing began there because. At the beginning of verse 14, when it says, he who holds withholds kindness, it begins as a quotation. But I don't see where it ends, where the, where the quotes end. And then in 24, it opens it again. And again, I don't see where it where it ends. So I, I, I don't know if that was a printing mistake. or. But what, what Job says, more importantly, is he who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. And, he, and he's speaking to his friends to these friends who have gathered around him and are now telling him what a wicked person he must be or what that he must have done something wicked for, you know, and we've only heard from Eliphaz at this point. Um, but it, he says, my brothers, those, those who have come to him are treacherous as a, as a torrential stream. They would, they would seek to just wash me away uh, or wear me down, um, to which are, Dark with, with which are dark with ice, and where the snow hides itself. Right? When they melt, they disappear. When it's hot, they vanish from their place. So when when their suffering comes, they don't have anything to say anymore. They are empty voices. And then he says he talks about caravans uh, turning from their course and and uh, from Tima and Sheba uh, because they were confident. Uh, and they come and they are disappointed. I and I. I'm going to put a, this is me, okay? I haven't studied what church fathers have said or anything like that on this. I'm just thinking about this. But in the time of, in the time of uh, Job, you would have had traveling merchant caravans that would go from, uh, I'll use the word municipality, city, village, from one to another to buy and sell goods. Um, and when they would come across a large, farm, let's say like a like an estate, which Job would have had, um, they often would stop there and trade well. And so as these caravans are coming along the road, they know that Job's estate is there and they're thinking, yeah, we're going to stop there and, and we'll do some trade. And Job's a wealthy man, so he's going to buy stuff and, and perhaps he's got some things to sell us to restock our, 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 uh, uh, our, our pack animals. And so as they arrive, they come they come uh, looking and with hope, but they're disappointed when they arrive because Job's now destitute, uh, even though the structures may still be there or whatever. Well, barns burned down, right? His barns burned down. His fields are, are burned. Um, and so um, for you now, for, for you have now become nothing. You see my calamity and are afraid. I, I, I have nothing. And did I did I ask for a bribe or did I ask for uh, the hand of the adversary or to be redeemed? No, he said, "All right, teach me to be silent. I will I will stop talking." Job says, um, "I will be silent. I won't I won't make my complaint against God, um, but make me understand how how I'm wrong. Make me understand how speaking my complaint to God is wrong." Um, your words, your upright words, you, you think you're so righteous and your words are forceful. How forceful are upright words? But what does reproof from you reprove? Right? Who are these, who are these men around Job, his friends, um, who are reproving him? Who are they to reprove him? Does, does their reproof change anything? Do you think that you can... Reprove words when the speech of a dis when what they're telling him his words are but wind, right? He he was this good man and upright and everything else that he's done and it meant nothing because apparently God's angered by him. So his words are but wind; they're nothing. So he says to them, "Look at me. 
I'm not going to lie to your face. Look at me. I'm in the midst of suffering, but God is still with me. Turn. Let no injustice be done. Turn. My vindication is at stake. My, my innocence is at stake here. Is there any injustice in my tongue? Am I speaking anything that's wrong? Cannot my palate discern the cause of calamity? Can't I taste and see that the Lord is, taste and know that the Lord is good? Or taste and know that sin is wicked? What is this all about? Well, again, Job is in the midst of his suffering, even as we suffer under the cross in our life. You will be, you will be persecuted for my name's sake, and the world will hate you. But even in the midst of his suffering, which is all now we know at Satan's hands, because God allowed the old wicked foe to do this to him, even as he allows the old wicked foe to test us at times, he remains faithful. And even as Eliphaz has said, oh, you must have done something awful bad to make God do this to you, he knows that God didn't do it to him. He knows that God allowed it to come upon him. And God's will is good. God's will is always good. Whatever it is, we, we just don't necessarily understand it. And that's what he's saying. He's crying out to the Lord, which is just. There's nothing wrong when you're suffering to say, Lord, why me? Now the answer will come, and we're a ways away from that, and we will get to it in the days to come as we read through Job. But for now, Job says, and, and you should say too to those who say, if God is so great, why is there suffering in the world? You too can say, be pleased to look at my face. I will not lie. God is good. Turn. Turn from accusing God of injustice and accuse the one who is unjust. Man and the old wicked foe. We are not good. In fact, again, I, I believe I said it a few days ago, the young man, when he came up to Jesus asking what he must do to inherit the kingdom of heaven said, good teacher, what must I do? And, God, and Jesus looked at him and said, why do you call me good? If you only recognize me to be a human being, a didaskalos, a teacher, a rabbi, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And God is good in everything that he does. Even if we don't understand why he allows suffering and testing to come upon us, God is always good. And here is how we know God is good. He gave his only begotten son to die for you, to save you from sin, death, and hell. He gave his son so that his wrath would be poured out on Jesus and not on you, so that he could save you from that wrath and from the power of sin, death, and the devil, and bring you into a prom the, the promise of eternal life with him. That's good. We suffer for a time in this world, but we know that in the end, we have a promise. That promise comes from God. God is good. Amen. Let's look to our prayer of the day. If I can find it here, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, your servant Silas preached the gospel alongside the apostles Peter and Paul to the peoples of Asia Minor, Greece, and Macedonia. We give you thanks for raising up in this and every land, evangelists and heralds of your kingdom, that the church may continue to proclaim the unsearchable riches of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. What are we doing? Oh, the Apostles' Creed. We continue. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we are bold to pray, as our Lord taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And for ourselves and others on this Friday, Friday morning. Uh, let us pray. God of all grace and mercy, the rising of the sun, the drawing of breath, the place where I live, the enjoyment of family and friends and food are all gifts from you. And if that were too little, you have given me even more. Through the death and resurrection of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, you have given me everlasting salvation and a place with you in your kingdom. Give these same gifts to all people. Let them see your daily provision. Let them hear the good news of the gospel preached. Allow them to receive mercy and grace in the outstretched arms of Jesus, who was high and lifted up on the cross for them. Help them to confess your saving name boldly and confidently. Heal the sick. Deliver the afflicted, strengthen the weak, care for the lonely, persecuted, and oppressed, restore the lost, give faith to the dying, comfort the grieving, and in my own moments of sorrow grant me a willing heart to cast my cares firmly upon you. Lead and direct my life again today, purify my thoughts, cleanse my sins, guard and keep me from every temptation. Make me faithful in my daily responsibilities and help me walk in faithful obedience to your commands. And let me continue to grow in your wisdom and grace. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray also for those who are suffering or in need, especially those today who have asked for our prayers. Pat, Lois, Anne, Brianne, Rose, Bob, Mike, Megan, Dan, Ezra, Neely, Jeremy, Ashley, John, Renee, Sh uh, Shazad, uh, and all those whom call upon your most holy name. Strengthen them for the days ahead. Grant them comfort in suffering. And always remind them of what you have given them. For you are our God who is good. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Mushtaq, you're not late. We're still in prayer. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things on this day, when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things, and your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, that ends our devotion for this Friday morning. God's peace be with you as we move through this day. And uh, tomorrow's Saturday, and I have a funeral up at Harshaw, so I'll have to figure out what I'm doing here. But uh, God's peace be with you, and, and we'll see you again soon. God's peace.